Ladies and gentlemen, it's match day. Ladies and gentlemen, it is not patch day. I'm already lying in this video. It's like a few days after patch day. I'm so sorry. I wanted to release this kind of video on patch day, but I got a bit distracted. But here it is. <gasps> wanted my full attention did you this is gonna be a bit different from the usual videos is honestly this is just gonna be a bit of a loose one of a nerd incoherently yapping about stuff i say that like that's not how any of my other videos go anyway in the build up to father coming home with the mo koyoverse released a seven minute short focus completely on Arlequino, delving into her past and showing that the company cannot stop themselves from turning everything into some form of tragic yuri i'm fully in support of this by the way I held off on watching it until after I completed a story quest, but now that I've done both, I decided, you know what, fuck it, I'll drag my crusty ass out of bed and ramble for a bit. Now, I'd already seen clips and screenshots of the short circulating on the Bird app even just minutes after it released, to be honest, that was expected, but even if I hadn't, I kinda knew this was gonna be good. The Harbingers, except Senora, have consistently had some of the best writing except Senora, preserving their moral greatness while also giving them interesting and more often than not, understandable motivations and relatable traits. Except Senora, they did that woman extremely dirty. My biggest fear surrounding Arlequino pre-release was that because we were going to get more focus on her in Fontaine, what with her featuring very prominently in the Archon quest and getting her own story quest, that the game was going to kind of soften her and try to make her into a sympathetic, forgivable character. Now given how they've previously handled Child, Scaramouche and Dottore, who are incredibly well portrayed villains and remain some of the most interesting figures in the game, perhaps I shouldn't have been so worried but I still had that lingering fear. I wanted her to be ruthless. I wanted her to be the person that Scara and Child described her as. A cold, brutal villainess who's not afraid to spill blood on the carpet if it means getting her way. I wanted her to stiletto you in the eye if it meant she could get five more from you to buy an ice cream. I wanted her to break my back and make me thank her for it. I'm happy to report that we still did get that, but a lot more. With the details surrounding her turning into probably one of, if not the most compelling antagonist Genshin has had in my opinion. She's still a villain and a very dangerous one at that, but she's not as morally bankrupt as she was first made out to be. It leaves her in this position where I don't think she's necessarily a sympathetic character, but a pretty understandable one, which I feel is the balance that they struck well with Scaramouche, and I feel like they walk that fine line even better with Arlequino. But I've been rambling and rambling and I haven't even talked about what's actually in the short. I told you this would be about as messy as my primo gem budget after wishes list update. They announced Chlorand as well. I'm gangbang levels of fucked for the next few patches. Anyway, this short mainly focuses on her past, revealing her relationship to Clervy and her rise to becoming the knave that she is in the present day. Right off the bat, I never want Hoyoverse to stop writing their doomed Yuri plot points, because clearly they know it's time to cook whenever they need to pull the They're Just Roommates card. They pull out the big guns whenever it's time to write some gay angst. Jokes aside, the short does an incredible job of really contextualizing who Arlequino is and giving us insight into why she's made the decisions that she's made, both in terms of her philosophy and how she portrays herself to others and how she wants to be perceived by others. The contrast between the former knave Crucibina and Arlequino as the father is one of the clearest and most interesting dynamics, and makes her cold and calculated persona feel a lot more fleshed out. She literally turned her mommy issues into father issues, with Crucibina being the soft, kind face that hides a knife behind her back, while Arlequino is clear that the knife will always be present on the table, even if she never wants to truly use it. Being a strict and rigid leader who may come across unfeeling but genuinely does want her children going down a path that they choose themselves rather than one that feels forced upon them. A mentality that both stands in opposition of and was influenced by Crucivina's view of the children as mere tools, pieces to move and discard in a game of chess that will only end in victory or death, where even in victory you will always be under Crucivina's thumb. The dynamic of Arlequino practically wanting to be everything that Crucibina was not is intriguing because on the surface they do produce similar results to each other. While they are very different and purposefully so on Arlequino's part, they share key similarities that inspire similar devotion to those who follow them. As Arlequino does note in a story quest, while they may diverge with their methods and their mindsets, 
They both wholeheartedly believe in rigid principles and strict enforcement of the rules without exceptions, which does create both devotion and discord for certain members. The difference is that while the former knave won this loyalty through manipulation and outright fear, there is a much greater sense of genuine admiration for Arlequino from her children, one that trumps any sense of fear that they may feel towards her. They're not necessarily scared of failing for their own sakes like the children under Crucibina's watch, it's more fear of letting her down, which may sound similar but it's a big difference in practice. The love that the children feel towards their father feels more genuine and more earnest rather than through the gaslighting and manipulation that mother employed. Their contrast is kind of shown visually in the fight between Crucibina and Arlequino. Crisabina appears to be a cryo user, she may be a hydro user, they were blue so it may be hydro instead of cryo, I'm not sure, while Olikino is a pyro user, we do know this. Yet their public personas almost embody the opposite of their vision symbolizing their true nature. Crisabina puts on the facade of a warm loving mother while actually seeing her children as tools and a means to an end to be discarded if they're not useful anymore. Whereas while Olikino presents herself as this cold, unmoving figure, she does provide true warmth to her children in her vision of the House of the Hearth. Their fight is almost a visual and symbolic representation of their true selves coming out at the dying moments, as their elements and fighting styles reveal who they truly are as people beneath their personas, presenting them as opposing forces on both fronts. An aspect that makes it more interesting is that the former knave did indeed urge Arlequino on to become the king of the House of the Hearth. As Clervy stated, it was almost expected that Arlequino would be the one standing tall at the end, and she did indeed become the leader of the House of the Hearth and the new knave, but as their father, not their mother. While she did achieve Crucibina's goal of a strong house with one true king at the throne, Arlequino's rebuilt house almost stands as an antithesis to Crisabina's beliefs, with Arlequino herself almost becoming her shadow, one who sought not to carry on the former knave's vision, but create her own vision, a goal that she succeeded in. She is the king, but it's on her own terms, and it's just, I'm, I'm just such a geek for this, I'm, I'm just rambling about this, this is why I like it so much. But you know what else I'm also a geek for? Tragedy and depression. And that's where we're going to talk about Clervy, who is also a prominent figure in the short. While I do feel Crucibina did a lot to inform Arlequina on who she wants to be as the figurehead of the house, Clervy had more of an impact on her when it came to how to handle herself emotionally. One of the key phrases she mentions in her story quest in terms of lessons she teaches her children is that anger makes you impulsive, sorrow makes you waver. That emotion must be controlled or even smothered in order to achieve your goals. And both of these aspects are also showcased in the short. With both how it's framed visually and the dialogue in both the short and the story quest implying that Clervy practically sacrificed herself or let Arlequino kill her during the duel instead of Arlequino kind of actually winning herself, it's clear that the sadness from needing to kill her only friend made her waver. Added to that, during her fight with Crucibina, Arlequino is clearly fighting with anger at the beginning and Crucibina maintains the upper hand until Arlequino detaches into that cold, efficient, sort of Terminator style we know her for. Which can I just say, she fucking Matrix evil Kamehameha Batista bomb nuked that woman. She put her entire coochie behind that final blow to Crucibina, holy shit. Both of these moments were instances where emotions nearly led her to a fall. Both of them being potential moments where she could have not become the knave. Moments where failure would have meant her death. And both where that failure would have been influenced by her emotions. Both sorrow and anger. They're key moments in her past that really reinforce her current philosophy. A philosophy that has paid dividends in the present day. That does make it interesting that Arlequino feels that Lenny is the one who should become the next king of the house. While he does show the conviction and skills that are needed for the role, 
He also does stand in opposition to what you would expect from an heir chosen by Arlecchino in a few ways. He's someone who does wear his heart on his sleeve despite his ability to manipulate and deceive, and unlike Arlecchino, is a lot more open with his undying love and loyalty to his family. He puts his family first, always, oftentimes above himself, and is prone to losing himself to his emotions whenever they're involved, an aspect that Arlecchino purposefully distanced herself from upon becoming the father. Yes, they do both value their family, but it manifests in pretty different ways in a lot of situations. Perhaps Arlecchino is merely acknowledging that his conviction and devotion to his family are what matters above all as she states in the story quest. Perhaps she thinks that only Linny is the one who could actually shoulder the burden of being king out of all of the children in the house. Or maybe it's more about Arlecchino still recognizing the importance of these emotionally attuned aspects deep down. Underneath that admittedly bougie ass suit, which can we acknowledge that she canonically prefers trousers, there is someone who does care for her children, even if it may never excuse her ruthless nature and frequent morally questionable actions along the way. In a way, while she did not become the knave that Crisabina envisioned for the house, she became the knave Clervy always knew that she could be, one who may pursue and conquer their pursuits with deadly conviction, but who values freedom of choice, one who does not seek to cage her children, but nurture them to fly with strength. And perhaps Arlecchino recognizes that smothering Linny with her rigidity and molding him in her image, as Crisabina attempted to do in her time as a knave, will only destroy him. And she recognizes that those who come after must walk their own path, even if it may not be the same as those who came before. It's not really about her own legacy, it's about the house. And she knows that one day she will pass and she will not be the knave anymore. And she just wants her children to walk their own path. At least when she passes, she'll finally be able to tell Clervy how beautiful the Aurora Inch and Naya look. Finally, to reference the points I made at the beginning of the video, I do like that they continue to preserve her villainous position, even with the tragedy that she went through. Despite her walking down a different path to the cruel Crucibina, She's still a ruthless woman who, lest we forget, practically molds child soldiers for the Fatui. She is not a nice lady. What this does is help us understand her perspective and give us insight into her past and mindset. But it doesn't automatically make her a sympathetic character. Which honestly is all I could ask for when you're approaching a villain like this. During the Archon quest, she walked this line of keeping both the characters and the players themselves on edge. Besides the fact that she was a Fatui Harbinger, during the Archon quest, she didn't really give us any blatant reason to not trust her. Yet we inherently knew that we definitely could not trust her. Her portrayal kept us on this knife edge of us always trying to find something disingenuous in what she was saying. And honestly, just the presence she brought was so refreshing for a villain in this game. She is a true diplomat, and she knows exactly how to play the game. The short shows us how she learned to play the game and why she does, rather than being used as a vehicle for us to sympathize with her struggles. As I said, I was worried that we're going to push her down a path of giving her a sad backstory and somehow absolving her of the things she's been said to have done. But they don't do that. They do give her a sad backstory, but it's just for us to understand her rather than forgive her. Don't get me wrong, Genshin has had some fantastic antagonistic figures so far. When they write the Harbingers, they randomly decide to whip out their literature PhDs and just cook some of the best characters in the entire game. But Arlecchino felt like a breath of fresh air in terms of how antagonists in the game have been portrayed. And while I do think there are one or two villains that can lay claim to being Tavat's best bastard, yes the thumbnail is kind of clickbait, I apologize, perhaps this is just Father's house after all and any other antagonist will have a tall order if they seek to take her throne. Some quick notes as well that didn't really fit into the flow of my rambling earlier. Why the fuck is Scaramouche like the most dripless man? Why is he so unserious? He can't even wear the coat properly. This is such maidenless behavior. He's such an unserious man. Really nice to see Signora in the Gucci Harbinger coat though. Secondly, Arlecchino became the fourth Harbinger at 14? 40? I was still eating snot and poking my balls with a pencil at 14. A more serious one, I do love how Lynette and Arlecchino are probably the most similar in terms of personality, 
And now Lynette is probably the one who follows Arlequino's teaching the most stoutly in the present day, both in terms of her efficiency and how she handles herself on a personal level, yet Arlequino feels Lenny should be the king instead of Lynette. Perhaps their kinship in that way means Arlequino feels some manner of responsibility to keep her away from that kind of burden, especially considering what Lynette has already been through. I don't know, it's an interesting thought, I'm just kind of spitballing. Finally, when the fuck are we getting the Genshin anime? Because after watching this, I need that shit like yesterday. And finally, that's all for me. Thank you so much for sticking around if you've listened to me ramble this whole time. I know I probably missed a lot of points and I could have expanded on certain things that I really didn't. But this was kind of just a loose ramble about things rather than a structured, well thought out, actually intelligent video essay. Mostly just because I was really happy watching the short and doing a quest and I was really excited and I liked this game and yeah, yeah. If you enjoyed it and want to see more of these kinds of things, please hit the thumbs up and the strange button that says subscribe. But for now, take care of yourselves and I'll see you in the next one.